Ache in the head, running of the nose, and the throat being pierced by pain like a spear. On this episode of Footnoting History, we're looking at medieval remedies for common ailments. Hello, I'm Lucy. Welcome to Footnoting History. On this episode, I'm delving into medieval medicine, looking at zero leeches, but lots of ways to deal with things like headaches and the common cold. From late antiquity to the late Middle Ages, that is, from about 400 to about 1400, home remedies were the norm, and domestic medicine could be based on sophisticated medical theory. Indeed, for most of this period, a lot of medical treatments were designed so that individuals could self-administer them. Although, and as in the case of over-the-counter remedies today, the person suffering from an ailment first had to obtain access to the remedy they needed. It's a common stereotype, and to me a depressing one, that medieval medicine consisted largely of bloodletting. When I tell people at parties that I study medieval hospitals, they're often shocked that such things even existed. They did, and a holistic view of spiritual and physical health and spiritual and physical care informed their functions. In East and West alike, hospitals were conceived of as integral to charitable and civic infrastructure, and they did not charge patients. Medieval hospitals were environments devoted to holistic healing and their practices of supplying appropriate food for the sick corresponded to medieval medical theory. In a collection of medical texts owned by a German hospital, for instance, there's a note that a young chicken with barley should be cooked to serve with cold medicines. Comfort food, of course, is a pretty universal concept. But according to the medical theories that were used and transmitted throughout the Middle Ages, the idea of comfort food was a more literal one. If you had a cold, it was because your four humors which filled the body were out of balance and you needed to become warmer. So warm foods and spicy foods could help heat up your body and speed up your blood. Chicken and barley or spiced red wine could be just the thing. And clearly, although syrups to be taken morning and evening were likely to be given in a hospital or perhaps sold through an apothecary, Anyone with access to cooking facilities could apply dietary cures. Practical and theoretical knowledge were pursued together throughout the Middle Ages. We see the assimilation of humoral theory into folk medicine and the adoption of folk or magic healing based on existing cultural or religious beliefs that extended through all layers of the population. Alexander of Tralles, for instance, a Greek physician writing in 6th century Rome, had both magical and other medicinal theories, and both of these were transmitted in his texts throughout the Byzantine Empire and in the Islamic world. Greek and Roman medical theories circulated around the Mediterranean. An example is found in a 5th century adaptation of Galen, created in North Africa. Pneumonia, the text explains, is characterized by stabbing pains in the chest, fever, and fluid in the lungs. The patient was to be given hot compresses with oil, hot wine, and soft wool pads, and also a salve of wax, cypress oil, and ground mustard, not too unlike Vicks Vaporub in aroma and effect. Another early collection of medical recipes, simply called Natural Remedies, was designed by its pseudonymous author to allow travelers, particularly, to treat themselves without resorting to doctors who had no previous knowledge of them and with whom they had no relationship of trust. I may feel confident, he wrote, knowing that if any illness befalls me, no money will go from my pockets to these people, nor will they be able to take advantage of me. A slightly paranoid author, perhaps, but one who has left us with useful knowledge. His practical advice tells us not only what kinds of medicines people were making in the fourth century, but the kinds of treatments that it were thought of as normal, like oxymel, a honey vinegar mixture which could be gargled, or porridge with coriander. Coriander? Yes. It was and is believed to be particularly good for regulating the digestion. Garlic, too, was praised as vigorously warding off every harmful condition to which human beings are prey. 
So if you were looking for an excuse to add extra garlic to your recipes, there it is. Regarding basil, however, the author of Natural Remedies observed that there is no consensus among doctors. Sorry about that. You will notice that the ingredients in the remedies under discussion here are chiefly distinguished by the fact that they're comparatively easy to grow and access. But what about when they weren't? What if you needed some poppy syrup to treat an earache, for instance? Well, the Eastern Mediterranean has an unusually rich variety of medicinal herbs. So, whoever controlled the Eastern Mediterranean had plants and knowledge about plants that were recognized as remarkable and worth getting one's hands on. From the 8th to the 13th century, this meant the Abbasid Caliphate. Pharmacies, hospitals, and medical gardens flourished in Damascus and especially in Baghdad, where many medical texts originated. And from the 11th century onwards, through translation and transmission, through the work of educated professionals like Constantine the African, such medicinal knowledge circulated through Western Europe as well. Religious men and women remained the main known providers of healthcare in medieval Western Europe. Constantine the African, for instance, was a monk at the great Benedictine monastery of Monte Cassino. Others increasingly entered the field of medical provision in the later Middle Ages. Almost a thousand years after the creation of natural remedies, John of Burgundy, a rather sententious author, wrote a treatise that, like natural remedies, was designed to help readers be their own physician, preserver, ruler, and guide. A key difference between John of Burgundy and earlier authors was that he was writing to help people cope not with the common cold, but with the Black Death. Still, all of the herbs he mentions are easily available, easy to grow in a kitchen garden in a variety of climates. His medicinal prescriptions are deliberately flexible, given with cheaper options for those worried about expense. And he offers many suggestions for purifying both the body and the environment, often using vinegar as a disinfectant. And vinegar, in addition to being effective at cleaning surfaces and combating bad smells, possesses antimicrobial properties as well. Arno of Villanova, a physician, alchemist, and astrologer, wrote a book of proven remedies on diagnosis and treatment. Chamomile tea, he explained, was soothing both to headache through vapor and aroma and to toothache. Arno also offers careful advice on when and how to take wine to aid digestion, or to use fennel water, perhaps less popular, for similar purposes. My personal favorite medical recipe comes from the encyclopedic work of the 12th century nun and mystic Hildegard von Bingen. Among other things, she was expert in the use of medicinal plants, and she includes in her writings a recipe for what can be called cookies of joy. Made with nutmeg, cloves, cinnamon, and sugar, the most perfect of all foods, they are designed to comfort the heart. Experience suggests that they are very successful in doing exactly that. Although trying to discover or reconstruct the identity of plants described in medieval texts can be challenging, we do know that the use of plants was not a desperate strategy and not a matter of trial and error. Rather, it was the result of careful observation. As Hassan Azaiza has written in studying the antifungal properties of herbs used in traditional Arab ethnobotany in the Middle East, the variety and extent of cultural attempts to provide answers to traditional medicines and to unsolved pathologies are firmly grounded in the curiosity and observational capabilities of humans. The use of an eye medication from Anglo-Saxon England to fight MRSA is perhaps the most sensational example of medieval medicine's effectiveness. But less sensational remedies for headaches and sore throats and melancholia show similar correspondences. Rose and violet syrups could be taken against headache. Peppermint and chamomile tea were used against sinus complaints and sluggish humors, which could refer to anything from the common cold to what we call seasonal affective disorder. Far from the grim stereotypes of pestilence and battle, most medieval medical practice was concerned with things like steam inhalations or recipes with honey, one of the latter being labeled, accurately in my view, confortatio, comfort. And then, of course, there are Hildegard's cookies. Medieval medical authors don't use the same language we do to talk about health. 
they didn't talk about the immune system or about antibiotics. But they do have lots of practical approaches to both prevention and treatment of illness, whether the stabbing pains of pneumonia or the more everyday miseries of a bad cough, and even, yes, sometimes plague. And even though we don't understand our bodies in terms of humoral theory anymore, we still believe in the power of herbal teas to help us feel better, to regulate digestion, to soothe sore throats, to calm our minds. We may still take soup made with chicken and barley as comfort in the long winter months. So, sensational or strange as it may sometimes seem, I find much that is familiar in medieval medicine. The desire to understand the causes of illness, the desire to feel better without spending much money, and, of course, the human desire to have our sinuses work. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>